Fort Felker, uh, who is our, our wind guy here. He's uh, got an uh, extensive experience in the wind industry, and he knows what it takes to commercialize technology. He knows what it takes to go from the very beginnings and early stages and, uh, and see that work. Um, so he is actually uh, the director of the National Wind Technology Center uh, at, the, at NREL, uh, the nation's uh, top um, principal research center for wind energy. Um, we have Min Lee. Min Lee is our solar expert. Uh, Min Lee is at uh, EERE, and he is heading up an ambitious effort uh, to achieve the, the country's sunshot goals, which is basically how can we make solar compete with fossil fuels, at least at a, a scale before we have to deal with huge integration issues. Um, but he uh, has a lot of knowledge about what it's actually going to take. He's looked very hard at these issues. And then finally, we have Armand Cohen, who is at uh, the Clean Energy, uh, Clean Air Tax Task Force. Sorry, um, and he's providing a little bit of an outside perspective. He's not solar specifically or wind specifically. Uh, his organization promotes renewable energy, uh, clean energies more generally, and it actually has a, a focus on uh, CCS um, and combined uh, taking fossil fuels and, and capturing the carbon. So that provides a little bit of an outside uh, perspective. So we're going to hear from them, uh, five minutes or so from each one of them. Then I'm going to lead a discussion. Um, and uh, there should be some cards on your, your tables. If you have questions, write your questions on that, and that's how we're going to facilitate the, uh, the audience questions um, today. So with, uh, no more talk from me. Let's go ahead. OK, well, those are not my slides. Um, where is our IT specialist? <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Ford Felker from the National Wind Technology Center at NREL. I'm going to talk just very briefly, just a few short minutes about what's happening, uh, the trends with wind in terms of technology, uh, deployment and cost over the last few years, uh, and then leave plenty of time for discussion. This is a very interesting plot. It's provided by the Energy and Information Agency. It's actually for a two-month period, uh, I think, January and February, I got this data from last year. Uh, it's a time of the year when it's a little bit windy, so uh, I'm showing my bias here. Uh, but this shows what's happening in terms of the trends of electricity production in the United States over the last 15 years or so. And it's a very interesting chart. You can see um, the big trend is the use of coal is falling off. Uh, our previous speaker described that well. It's mainly being replaced by natural gas growing. Many other sources of energy are really quite flat. Uh, nuclear, flat. Uh, conventional hydropower, perhaps a slight decline. And uh, this line here that's trending towards zero is the use of uh, fossil fuels for gener generating electricity. Fossil fuels really quite expensive for making electricity. And the last line I want to talk about is the one that's starting to perk up here. This, this sort of brownish line at the bottom, you start to see trending up over the last few years. What that is, is non-hydropower renewables. So let's break that out. Well, the big story here is wind. Uh, wind has had explosive growth in the United States over the last 15 years or so. Uh, the other non-hydropower renewables, uh, less, less of a, uh, a growth trend than you're seeing for wind. And that's really a, a fairly astonishing development. Uh, the United States electricity system is, is enormous, and to have that kind of growth is actually quite a bit of power. This is the scenario that was uh, posited by the Department of Energy in 2008 for how we might achieve 20% of the nation's electricity from wind by 2030. So you see most of that coming from land-based wind, the blue, uh, some proposed offshore wind contributing out in the later years. When this scenario was proposed by the Department of Energy in 2008, uh, many criticized it as being uh, unrealistic. Uh, we couldn't ever possibly achieve this. You know, how can you, how can you think that such a thing could be possible? Well, let's look what's happened since then. 
the actual growth of wind has uh, greatly exceeded uh, what many regarded as an unrealistically aggressive scenario. Uh, just in the last year, 2012, the United States states set a new record with uh, something like 13,000 megawatts of wind deployed. Wind is now uh, about 6% of the nation's electrical capacity. Uh, that's, that's a lot of electricity because the United States has such a large, uh, large grid. The total power production of wind is up to three and a half or so, it's heading close to 4%. So this is capacity. If you look at the total power produced by wind compared to the nation's total, it's up to 4% or so. So, um, you know, 4% isn't a lot, but it's a, it's a heck of a, a growth trend over the last few years. And this has been driven by the fact that wind costs have become very competitive with conventional power sources. Uh, and also, a topic I'd like to explore more with the panel is the reliability, the long-term stability. When you sign a wind contract, you lock in your price for 15, 20 years. It's, uh, you can't do that, of course, with fossil-based fuels, and it's one of the attributes of wind that makes it uh, contributes to its growth. So I think we need to move beyond cost and start thinking about a risk-based discussion. What's the risk of our energy supply? What's the risk of price increases? Uh, one reason wind has done well is because there is no risk of price increase. You sign a 20-year power purchase agreement. Some of this growth has also been driven by uh, policies in the states, although, although there is no federal policy uh, that specifically, excuse me, <clears throat> specifically mandates renewables. Many states do have what are called renewable portfolio standards, and that's been an important factor in this growth. So with that, I'll, I'll hush up and let some other speakers talk and leave plenty of room for discussion. So I'm not going to use any slides here. Um, when Michael gave his keynote address uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, there were a few things that resonated in my mind tremendously. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how I believe that uh, innovation is a necessary but not sufficient uh, part of the equation in order to uh, solve our nation's energy supply and, and in fact, to solve a lot of our challenges that, uh, that we have here in this sector. So um, let, let me tell you why I feel that way. Um, historically, um, uh, there was a social compact between the US government uh, or any sponsoring organization funding research and development in order to uh, have some net benefit to society. Okay, uh, uh, you know, you look back 50 years or so of U.S. government funding of technology uh, that ends up having, that ends up uh, eventually pipelining into the marketplace and therefore generating jobs at companies, generating GDP. Now, in today's world where the world is really flat and, uh, and companies uh, uh, no longer have that social compact necessarily with you know, uh, locating manufacturing facilities where uh, their uh, technology is developed, it's all changed. It's really changed tremendously in a world where that social compact is no longer there. It's also changed tremendously in a world where countries uh, uh, use different uh, mechanisms uh, that then make an international uh, you know, trade issue um, very challenging in this space. And so, um, so let me give you some statistics. Uh, at the Department of Energy, we funded uh, research and development in solar energy technologies, and more specifically, uh, PV technologies, making solar cells more efficient over the past 35 years. Um, and when you look at the data on that, what you find is that the, um, the world records for these uh, solar cell efficiencies, innovation, if you will, uh, has 57% uh, of them have been funded by the Department of Energy, by the US government. So we really own the world in terms of innovation. Okay, we have some of the greatest research universities in this world. We have some of the greatest national laboratories. We have a culture of actually risk taking. We, we have a culture where scientists and engineers will take ideas that are germinated uh, you know, in R&D, you know, in our nation's laboratories, at universities, you know, businesses, large and small, and take those ideas and take risks into the marketplace. Furthermore, we have a culture whereby our um, venture capitalists, our you know, early stage capital, will take those risks and will back those risk takers and to, to take those companies, take, take, take those ideas into fruition. Now keep in mind, a lot of those will fail. 
that's okay. Failure is okay because failure actually means that you are taking those risks in order to have those big successes in the future. Now the challenge that we're facing today is that those companies, th those ideas that are initially germinated with your and my taxpayer dollar, they no longer feel the need. They, they no, no, they, it's actually not competitive for them to actually translate that innovation to production, which is actually where most of the job, a lot of the job creation and a lot of valuable job creation is, uh, you know, all the way through to deployment. So, um, uh, so that's actually the bad news. The good news is that in the United States, in the area of solar energy, uh, uh, there's tremendous growth. Uh, this past year, we installed roughly 3.2 gigawatts of solar, which is, you know, uh, not quite double from the prior year. There's over 119,000, uh, you know, f uh, fellow people in the United States working in the solar sector. That's a 13% uh, job growth rate in this sector alone. I mean, imagine 13% year-over-year job rate, uh, growth rate. That's six times faster than the broader economy. So there's good news in terms of deployment. The challenging side is, is that social compact that we used to have in this country where we make investments at the earliest stages and then hope, hoping that uh, that will translate eventually to, uh, you know, the innovations will translate into manufacturing uh, uh, and furthermore deployment. And so let me talk to you about a little bit, uh, very briefly, about a program that we run at the Department of Energy. It's called the Incubator Program. And this is a program that we've run uh, you know, in conjunction with NREL at the early days. Uh, since 2007, we funded something like 60 or 70 different small businesses uh, to, with an aggregate amount of roughly 70 million US federal taxpayer dollars. These are small companies that receive you know, on the order of half a million, a million dollars, uh, maybe $2 million in government R&D support. And that, uh, and what's really exciting about uh, this program is that uh, uh, follow on after these companies uh, finish the program, they've been able to raise an aggregate amount of private capital of somewhere around $1.7 billion. So $70 million in taxpayer funds results in follow on, in follow -on investments of roughly $1.7 billion. And I do want to point out that not all the companies in this program are actually successful. Many of them uh, have failed. In fact, a number of them have already failed. But what's really important is that the ones that succeed are the ones uh, uh, that can actually succeed really well. And so, um, so innovation, you know, I want to start with that. Uh, so, but the challenge that we have here is, is how do we make sure that we have policies in the United States that allows those innovators, those great minds that, take, that have taken those risks to actually set root here and actually produce something. Because in the United States here, you know, I talked about 3.2 gigawatts of solar deployment in the, in the past year. We actually don't make all that in the United States. Okay, we actually import a lot of that product. And so how do we become a country that used to make 43% of the worldwide products for solar energy to, to a country that now only produces 2% of the worldwide products? How do we become a, a country that actually uh, uh, pipe, that helps innovators take those risks, which we do great, a great job at, to actually making jobs in the United States by, you know, through manufacturing? And, and that's a great challenge, which I think that uh, hopefully we can talk about the rest of the panel. Great. So I'm going to start where... So I'm going to start where Kevin did, which is not... Uh, I'm not going to talk about, you know, can solar or wind compete in particular geographies or, 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 or different, uh, at different times. Certainly that's true. Um, I want to address the, the, the possibility and the limits uh, and where innovation is needed to have very significant contributions to the grid from these resources and to get from forts, you know, 2 to 4 percent up to, say, 20 percent. To get there, though, we have to start with some brutal math, and this is often what is missing, to, to follow Michael's point from, from some of these discussions. So let me just start with the bad news. Um, it's often asserted that wind and solar are, you know, getting close to grid parity. Um, but whenever you see that claim, you need to really look at the map and say, parity in comparison to what? What's the baseline? So typically folks will, will look at, say, retail rates of nine cents uh, or ten cents a kilowatt hour and say, well, you know, a solar, you know, a solar uh, PV installation could, uh, can match that um, or can beat that. The problem is that the real competitor in the bulk power system is wholesale power price, what the utility can buy power at. And right now, that's about three cents in most of the country. Um, if you have a capacity constrained utility, the marginal cost might be closer to six, but it's not nine. 
um, or 10 or 12. And you know, so that's, that's kind of an important piece of confusion that, that one needs to clear up. So the, the bogey may be a lot tougher than, than is often asserted. Um, second, you often see uh, presented you know, the, 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 the cost per unit of solar panel or whatever is, uh, is, get, is trending towards zero. You know, we're, we're to have, you can read papers that say we'll be down to 50 cents a kilowatt or something like that pretty soon. Um, the important point to realize is there's still balance of system. Um, there's still all the rest of the equipment that, that goes with that. Uh, you know, I, mean, I don't know what a good proxy, I would say maybe $2,000 per kilowatt, something like that would be a, maybe a current good proxy. But then you say that's a capacity factor of say 15, 20%. You have to multiply that by five, you're up to $10,000 a kilowatt which is sort of beginning to look like nuclear costs. Um, so, you know, again, hopefully we'll get the balance of system costs down and we should certainly work on that, but um, that's, a, that's a key point of math. Um, uh, there are physical constraints, obviously. Um, the, uh, you know, wind, uh, wind plants are, you know, consume a lot of, lot of area, take up a lot of ocean or whatever. Uh, that 300 gigawatts uh, to get to 20% penetration, just for reference, that's the, that's the size of the entire coal fleet in the United States. It's 300,000 one megawatt turbines. Um, and well, we can talk about that later. Um, the, the real issue, though, that I wanted to flag is the intermittency issue. I think that's really the Achilles heel. Um, and you know whether we can patch up that heel and, and, uh, and make it work is, is another question. But this is a, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but uh, uh, this is basically five different studies, including National Renewable Energy Labs, look at what happens to system costs um, or the costs of renewable energy for PV and, and, and wind as you get to very high penetrations, like up to 80% uh, on the U.S. grid. Or, or parts of the U.S. grid. One, a couple of these are, are, are Texas. And as you can see, there's, uh, there are various proxy measures of marginal cost of, of adding the next you know, uh, PV or wind installation. But you can see that sort of south of 20% of penetration, you get sort of a doubling or even tripling of, of total cost. And why is that? It's because you know, the intermittency problem. Wind doesn't blow all the time. Sun doesn't shine all the time. You need to build a hell, hell of a lot of you know, backup gas capacity for example, and ride on the backbone of a very stable grid system to be able to back up those, those uh, peaks and valleys. Um, you know, we can argue about the numbers, um, but you know, I think generally speaking, you know, this, this story is we, we have a big problem with intermittency and variability. If you're at low penetration, you can ride on the backbone of this very stable system, uh, and that's great. Um, uh, there, some people cite the recent NREL study saying we can get to 80% renewable by 2050. Um, but when you read the fine print of that study, what it says is, well, we can do that, but actually 50% of that, only 50% of that 80% is really variable. The rest is biomass or other um, non-variable resources. We, we need up to 100 gigawatts of new hydro. Good luck. Um, 46 gigawatts of um, interruptible load. Uh, somewhere between 52 and 152 gigawatts of cost-effective um, uh, grid-scale energy storage. Um, those are pretty heroic assumptions, and they, they assume a lot of innovation, um, which is kind of my point. I hope we can get there, um, but it, it ain't going to be easy. And just so that you don't think I'm, I'm uh, pushing you know, uh, against renewables entirely, I work a lot on carbon capture and storage. We've got a whole bunch of problems there, too. Energy penalties, uh, scale, um, all kinds of issues. Uh, certainly on nuclear, we have a whole bunch of, of issues. I guess the difference, and the reason I'm actually working on those latter two resources is that at least they plug and play pretty well into a centralized grid. You don't, at least don't have this problem to deal with. By and large, actually, nuclear is somewhat inflexible, so it creates other problems. But it, it, this, this is, this is the, I, I really would urge us to focus quite a bit on this. And I think if it's not storage, um, we are going to have to have another silver, silver bullet. Is that timing right? No, no I, I think we've moved on to the, okay. the next round. Just right? one, last, one last stat. So we need a lot of innovation. So. Um, just a, a number to leave with you. Um, it's not like we're not spending money on deployment of, of wind and solar. The, uh, Bloomberg just reported that in 2012, despite the recession, the world spent a quarter of a trillion dollars, $250 billion, on new wind and solar installations. Now, maybe that's a good thing. Um, I, the total R&D expenditure, pri public and private globally last year, uh, for, for, for all renewables was closer to $12 billion. I would argue something's out of whack there. That is, with these kinds of challenges, um, it's good to be deploying, and we're certainly lot, learning a lot from deploying, 
but we need to be getting a lot better on working on some of these, these core challenges like, as I mentioned, balance of system costs and uh, intermittency integration, grid scale storage, those kinds of things which are getting nickels. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. So um, what I really want to do, and I think what could be the most valuable thing to do today, is, is to set a firm foundation of where we are really now with solar. So we've heard about solar and wind. We've heard about wind growing, and it certainly has been growing. We've heard about solar. The prices come down quite a bit. Um, and there's certainly innovation. We've seen records broken in terms of the efficiencies and those sorts of things. Um, but as Mar Armand has pointed out, there are issues as we think about scaling this up. So I guess there's a couple things. It might actually work better if I could start out and just say, what I've heard and what I've learned is that wind, when you have good resources, you can actually get down to something like 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour. When you stretch it out, and, you, and it, assuming that the wind turbines actually last as long as they're supposed to last, and the wind blows the way you think they're going to win. So it's actually pretty good. And by some analyses, looking ahead, th that's more expensive than wind and coal right now. But if you look ahead at new installations, uh, assuming that natural gas prices aren't going to stay as low as they have been, that you might actually be sort of competitive. So the, at a, not a taking over the world scale, but at, at, a, at a smaller scale. So first of all, does that sound about right to you about the, in terms of the cost? It, and then I wanna, I wanna go beyond that and, and think about this chart that we have uh, hanging over our heads right here. What happens then when you think we need to do a lot more? We need to go beyond to 4% to something 20% or more in order to really handle this big problem, not just in the United States, but worldwide, of uh, trying to get down to new, near zero carbons, getting off of fossil fuels, uh, or getting off of, uh, just a gesture to CCS, uh, getting off of uh, carbon uh, sources of, of energy. So I'll, I'll comment on the cost. Is, is this the right here? Is this on? I don't think it's on. No. You gotta turn your mic. I turned it on. It's green. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody back needs to turn it on. I'll just bellow. There we go. Well, <laughs> uh, the cost numbers are actually even better than that. In 2011, uh, long-term power purchase agreements, 15, 20-year agreements were signed for wind at a range of prices, depending on the quality of the resource. It's windier some places than it is other. But that range was typically uh, five cents to eight cents. So these are wholesale prices that power companies uh, are, are signing up to. So uh, yeah, it's absolutely cost competitive. Uh, with the PTC in place, of course, that brings it down to three to three to six cents uh, per kilowatt hour. So it's absolutely cost competitive. Uh, the, the, the difficulties on operating the grid with large amounts of uh, variable uh, renewable sources on board, such as wind or solar, uh, will become an issue. There's no question about that. And I think it is a need uh, to begin innovating, begin uh, investing in the research and development to solve that problem. It's really not a problem today. Uh, there, are, there are many places worldwide where uh, wind is 20% uh, penetration uh, or, or more in, in various countries. Uh, we've seen 50% or more uh, wind penetration uh, in Colorado last year, in Texas last year. As a, it's a temporary. It, it, yeah, as a, as a not total energy. energy. Yep. Right. Uh, total, um, you know, <coughs> Iowa, uh, South Dakota are over 20% wind now. So it, it, you can get to pretty high levels of penetration and still operate the grid successfully. The increase in natural gas is a great story because the flexibility of the natural gas power plants allows you to very rapidly ramp the power up and down in contrast to nuclear or coal power plants. And so gas plays really well with wind and solar. And that's a, that's a great synergy. The increase in natural gas really buys us time to solve the intermittency problem that, uh, that Armin touched on. OK, great. So Min, um, we've talked before about your goals at, uh, as part of the Sunshot, Sunshot Initiative. And, and getting down to six cents per kilowatt hour is what you'd like to do, five or six cents, I think. And, uh, and can you talk a little bit about where we are now and what you've laid out as a roadmap to get to that? And now, just keep in mind, that is talking about six cents per kilowatt hour without that chart, without getting up to high penetration. But let's establish first what it's going to take to get sort of to where wind seems to be right now, if, if, uh, right. if Ford's got the right numbers there. So before I talk about where we are right now, I'd like to talk a little bit about where we've been. Uh, in 2010, when we started planning uh, for the Sunshine Initiative, Secretary Chu challenged us to think about cost, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of 
total cost for deployments. And he, he challenges us to think about it in a way where, uh, imagine uh, what would happen, what could happen, if you didn't actually have to have enormous amounts of subsidies, which quite frankly are not scalable indefinitely. At the levels that we have right now, you can't scale it indefinitely. Uh, I think Europe, uh, Germany alone, uh, has basically backed uh, you know, solar to the tune of 120 billion euros over the next 20 something years. Uh, you know, I think if you scale that to the United States, uh, for, you know, a country our size and what our potential is for solar, uh, that would quickly bankrupt us. So, uh, so at the levels where we have deployment right now, uh, solar energy uh, with the subsidies levels that we have, you know, it's reasonable, but it's not, uh, not infinitely scalable. So Secretary Chu challenged us, what can we do to improve the technology, reduce the cost, uh, so that you don't need those subsidies in the future. And so uh, back in 2010, utility scale solar systems were selling for roughly $3.80 a watt. $3.80 a watt. And to, in order to get to roughly uh, 5 to 6 cents a kilowatt hour at wholesale, it would translate to roughly $1 a watt. And, and so that's about a 75% cost reduction in a period, and he challenged us to do so in a period of 10 years. Well, fast forward two and a half years. Today, utility scale systems are selling for between $2 and $2.50 a watt. A dramatic reduction in just two and a half years. And we have, you know, seven and a half years to go now in, in order to get to do, uh, 2020. Uh, still a lot of, uh, of advances need to happen in order for us to achieve that, but some advances are already taking place. Uh, and that's the wholesale rate of electricity. One of the, the, um, the nice things about solar is that it can also be put on people's roofs, rooftops, either the residential or commercial sector. And there, you don't necessarily compete against wholesale rate. You compete against retail rates of electricity, which are typically two times that of wholesale rate. And so, uh, but there, the challenges are even greater because even though the, the hardware costs have come down very dramatically, you know, in the past uh, just two years, the, the solar panels themselves have fallen from roughly $1.80 to $2 a watt. Now you can buy solar panels for roughly 65 cents a watt. Okay, imagine that, a very dramatic reduction in the hardware costs. What hasn't come down and is most uh, prominent on the uh, residential and commercial sec side are what we call the soft costs. And so, uh, let me go back to the theme here uh, uh, of this conference about innovation. And I'm gonna say that innovation is not just in the laboratory. It's not just about innovating, you know, making a higher efficiency solar cell. It's about innovating in business processes. It's about innovating in the way you look at the world. Okay, uh, compared to Germany, ger the cost of installing a solar on your rooftop in Germany is about $2 to $2.50 a watt. That's what a German citizen would pay right now. In the United States, it's about two times that, between five and six dollars a watt uh, for that upfront cost. Well, think about this for a second. The hardware, the solar panels, cost pretty much the same. No matter where in the world you are, it costs the same. So what's the difference there? The difference is what, you know, what we call the soft cost, the non-hardware cost, and that's where uh, in this country, we have not been able to go over what, you know, some of this is the red tape, if you will, uh, you know, uh, uh, reduce some of those costs, which are quite significant in this country. Kevin, can I just offer a quick response? Sure, and before you do that, I just wanted to say, I just want to remind everyone about the cards, and I think if you hold them up, people will come around and get them and, and bring them up, and then I'll look through them, and uh, it, it, toward the end of the discussion, we'll uh, do that. So there's a couple here, I don't know if there's, any others? There's one in the back there. Um, so, Armand, would you like yeah, to I just, respond to what we've I just here? a quick question for you: your five to eight cent um, wholesale contract price. I presume that that's um, that's net of the PTC. So, no, uh, that's that's before PTC. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, um, you know, I uh, presumably people are bidding in, assuming that they have the PTC directly paid. Uh, those are lower numbers than I've seen. I, I guess the, my my main point or my main response is that these numbers again, are by and large ignoring the system costs. And as you can see, as you even you get to 20% penetration, some of these studies are suggesting you're as much as doubling the cost. And I think that's a really important point because everyone wants to talk about bus bar costs. No one wants to talk about the gas capacity and the other balancing parts of the system that are, that are necessary to make that, those levels of penetration possible. I'm not saying it's an unsolvable problem. I'm just saying that when we talk five, eight cents, 20% penetration, we're not talking about all that combined cycle gas turbine capacity that's sitting idle. Um, Spain, you know, great success story on wind and solar. Uh, they've, got, uh, they've got their combined cycle gas turbine fleet massively overbuilt to deal with that intermittency problem running at 15% capacity factor. That's a real cost, folks. 
and it's going to get worse as you get as you get north of 10 20 percent and i wanted to clarify something when we talk about percent penetration here i believe these numbers here are actually the total electricity produced not just a yeah or gigawatt, is it gigawatt hours I gigawatt think. hours not not capacity and that's something to clarify so when fort was talking about some places it got up to 50 percent already that's sometimes there's a lot of wind blowing it's not 50% over the course of the year of total electricity. So when we try to get up to those larger scales, that is a completely different kind of a, of a challenge. Um, yeah. If I might make a suggestion, I think within the overall context of achieving a sustainable energy system, we talked about uh, greenhouse gas. Another issue that I think needs to be on the table is water use. Um, the fossil-based fuels consume a vast amount of water. Uh, one of the one of the benefits of the wind and solar technologies is they use virtually no water at all. We saw a huge drought in the United States uh, last year. I, I tell you, I live in Colorado. There is no snow in the Rockies. Uh, I, I think we may have another year of drought. As the droughts continue, as the climate changes, as the weather patterns shift, uh, the availability of water is going to become more constrained. And one of the energy use is actually the number two source of water, water consumption in the United States behind agriculture. So we have the opportunity not only to solve the, uh, the greenhouse gas problem, but to solve the water problem as well. Okay. So um, this is my personal interest, and also I'm seeing a couple of questions here asking to go a little bit more into the technology. Um, wow, I, you know, there's no way we're going to get to all these. Um, but it's good they're written down because we can uh, provide these to the panelists afterwards, and uh, maybe we can figure out a way to post them somewhere online. Um, great. <laughs> Wow. All right. We can just spend the. How about we just spend the rest of the day on this panel? Is that okay? With um, all right. So, um, in, okay. In terms of technology, I am interested in, in, to see how we can go beyond uh, small scale and get to the big scale. What we're really going to need to do. Um, uh, so, I'm going to start with solar because that's actually something I'm a little bit more familiar with. Uh, I've just been written uh, writing more about wind lately, uh, but but solar. So we talked about soft costs getting the cost down to what they are in Germany, hopefully. Um, but we still need to have innovations in, in the solar panels themselves. We need to make them much more efficient so you can put fewer of them on a roof and save installation costs that way, save manufacturing costs. Um, to get the six cents, you can get to have to drop the cost by half, or by 50% again, okay? And then, so, so how do we do that? And then what do we need in terms of technology to go beyond uh, that to actually having really large scale solar that can deal with the intermittency issue. Okay, so let me break the, uh, the question down into a couple of uh, things first. First, the technology advances that can still take place and will continue to take place in the, uh, the solar panel itself. So the average you know, solar panel today uh, out in the field is somewhere around 14 and a half, 15 percent efficient. Okay, that's not so bad. Um, uh, and in the coming years, that will certainly climb up uh, through innovations in all sorts of different areas. You know, our scientists in our labs uh, at, you know, national labs, at universities, at companies, continue to innovate and continue to make advances that will, n number one, make some incremental steps, you know, up that performance curve. But, but two, also um, uh, make some significant breakthroughs in terms of cost reductions. And cost reductions in manufacturing, I mean, you know, we can make some very efficient, very high performance solar cells. In fact, we send some of those into space. But you know what? You and I won't be able to afford that. And so the challenge is not just innovation to make you know, the best you know, high performing product out there, but it's to do so at a, in a cost effective manner. Uh, uh, so that solar can broadly solve our nation's, at least contribute to our nation's uh, uh, you know, energy, energy solution. And so, um, so there are a number of things that are going on uh, that will continue to advance the technology, that will continue to uh, reduce the cost. And in fact, my office funds a lot of that. So um, uh, you will not be surprised to see you know, new performance records out there, and you will not be surprised to see the cost of, of these systems come down. But I also want to point out one very important thing here is that the cost, in order to reduce costs and increase the performance, you actually need to make it. Okay, uh, the, the, one of the reasons why anything gets cheaper over time uh, is, is because companies are actually producing it and selling it, and, and therefore uh, creating a return on their investment that they can reinvest in R&D. And so um, you look across all sorts of things, all sorts of uh, products. 
you name it, computer chips. The reason why Moore's Law is there, because they can sell computer chips and they can reinvest those dollars into R&D. You look at beer, if you look at the history of beer making, it turns out that the cost of all sorts of things re, uh, get cheaper the more you make it. The more beer you make, you know, the cheaper the beer, the, the beer that you've, you've made, you know, that you can make today from compared to yesterday. And so uh, there's, there's all those issues that you have to, you, you can't just separate it from, you know, the great minds that we have in our laboratories to, you know, producing some gee whiz gizmo that then will immediately scale to, you know, to ginormous proportions. You have to think about it in terms of the entire ecosystem. How do you sustain something that will actually, you know, enable your innovators to actually produce something that will then result in lower cost? Um, and uh, maybe since we, we talked about technology gets it at six percent, six cents per kilowatt hour just now, um, maybe it makes sense to switch over to wind right now and just hear what kinds of innovations do you think are necessary to push us beyond where we're at right now. Um, I have a question here about superconducting wind turbines. Uh, there's another question, and, and maybe you could just open this up to the, to the, to the whole panel too. Um, uh, what about the grid? When you expand the grid, what does that do to shore up the, the, the variability issues? Um, and, and just as a general comment, so I'm seeing a lot of questions here about, about, the, uh, about finance, about innovation, about uh, how do you get venture capital working, um, and those kinds of things. And I think I'm going to defer that a little bit, because I think what we really want to do in this panel is establish as, as good as possible where we are with the technology. And the rest of the, the day, we're going to be going on and talking more about policy, where we should go. And I think that that might be a better place to, to focus on a lot of those questions. Um, um, and here's another question about power storage innovation um, uh, and what might be needed. So, so let's talk a little bit about uh, where wind can go to get the price down. And I, th I think one of the big issues is offshore wind is this huge resource. And um, especially looking outside the United States, uh, it might be even more important for other countries. Um, how do we get those costs down? And, uh, and then talk about what do we need to really handle this intimacy issue? Um, well, that was a lot of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to do like a politician and answer the one I want to answer. And, and, no, uh, and I'll re-ask the question <laughs> I want to have the answer to. Um, in terms of continuing to innovate in wind technology, I think uh, the earlier speaker noted there's been a tremendous drop in wind turbine cost over the last few years. There's also been quite a large increase in their performance. So we've made uh, the combination of lower cost and higher power production has really made a big difference. Uh, at the National Renewable Energy Lab, you know, for many years our target was beat coal uh, because uh, agreeing with the previous speaker that um, you know, winning on price changes the world. Well, we've done that now. Uh, what was unforeseen was that natural gas would, prices would drop so quickly, so our, we have a new target, you know, beat natural gas. To do that, to, to continue to uh, compete with natural gas head-to-head -head with the absence of any subsidies, because I agree that they're not sustainable, um, we believe we need to cut the cost of wind in half again. Uh, not that different than the targets Min has described for solar. And we're investigating completely different architectures of wind turbines to uh, go to uh, much, much larger machines. We're thinking of uh, 10, 20 megawatt machines to get at the issue Armand um, noted earlier about we really don't want half a million wind turbines. We'd really rather have, say, 10,000 much larger wind turbines. So we're innovating around those ideas at the National Renewable Energy Lab now. In terms of um, the intermittency issue, I'll, I'll take a quick stab on that one. I think you can make a lot of progress on operating the grid more flexibly. And as I mentioned earlier, the natural gas plants that are uh, coming online very rapidly now uh, do have that flexibility inherent. So in some sense, as um, renewable sources displace the fossil sources, you've got that sunk cost of natural gas plants already in place that will provide the balancing needed to uh, operate the grid in a flexible manner. Kevin, I, I just, again, uh, just to offer a friendly challenge there. Um, I think the problem is we're thinking about these gas turbines as sunk costs. They're not. If you're going forward and you're talking about a large build-out of intermittent resources, those are additional capacity you're going to have to build. They have to, the counting has to be done right, and it has to be somehow attributed to the, to the intermittency you're introducing to the system. So, I mean, I think it, just the other thing I would say about storage is it's a tough bogey. I mean, you know, are you really going to get grid scale gigawatt day storage that's co less costly than a gas combined cycle turbine? 
that's a pretty tough standard. Um, I mean, others may want to talk about this later. It's a big technical challenge if we're really going to get, you know, those costs down. Um, you also have the problem in Texas where the wind doesn't blow for weeks at a time. You know, then you just bring in, you have to have your complete installed wind capacity base ready to fill a very long valley. So these are, these are not incidental or, or trivial problems. This is a big, big challenge. Um, do you want to add anything about what it would take to go beyond the six cents and actually get to these larger scales and be competitive? Um, grid we have questions about grid innovation. Uh, we've talked about storage some. And in fact, maybe we could talk, we, the next panel is going to talk more about storage in, in general. But um, where do you see the innovation happening, maybe not just in solar, but outside of solar to, to address those issues? So, so let me look at it from a uh, different perspective. Um, instead of just thinking about solar as an energy source, you know, and let me talk about it in the residential and commercial uh, building context. Instead of looking at it just as an energy supply that is intermittent, uh, intermittent and is diurnal, okay, uh, think about the home, the commercial business as a system. As, think about it as part of a system where you might even interconnect electric vehicles. You might have demand response uh, within the greater context of that dwelling, okay, the home, the commercial business. And when you look at it from that standpoint as a system, uh, some of your challenges are actually already mitigated because there are some inherent uh, uh, masses, if you will, uh, dampers, you know, in that broader system. And then when you look at it even more broadly in terms of neighborhoods, in terms of uh, uh, feeders, then, then uh, there are some uncorrelated events which will then uh, minimize some of the intermittencies as well. But uh, I, I do want to accept that there are some tremendous challenges that will lie ahead uh, when uh, there are much, much higher levels of penetration uh, in our uh, nation's grid than we currently have today at the l relatively low levels that we have on most feeders across the United States uh, that we have today, it's not a huge problem. But, uh, but that's also uh, a, an important role of government is to work on those problems that will happen 5, 10, 15 years from now. And when I look at the studies, uh, when I look at the high penetration studies where you have pretty high levels of wind, pretty high levels of, of solar integrated into the grid, I'm actually pretty afraid. Okay, there are some there are some challenges that will lie ahead uh, on you know some of the you know uh, brightest spring days where you have you know excess amounts of renewable uh, integrated into the grid and you you start having to think about cycling cycling nuclear plants you know no one's going to do that of course but uh, but there's some some real great challenges uh, that are not trivial and so I don't want to diminish that that will ultimately add cost to the system because somebody has to bear those costs somebody has to bear those costs of those uh, natural gas peaker plants that are idling you know, at, and running only at 15% capacity. And so um, we have to look at this as a holistic system, okay, as, part, as a diverse energy mix and how do, how do all these different systems work together to, to create you know, a robust and resilient energy network. Okay. <clears throat> so we've, we've heard about the need for obviously lots of innovation cutting the, the cost of wind in half to within a mincy, there's a lot of things like that. Can we get at least gesture a little bit to what kinds of policy support are needed, given that we really do need substantial innovation to go forward? Uh, it, it, it's not just enough to keep scaling up uh, existing technology. Uh, that's what I'm hearing from, from you. So. Kevin, just a couple thoughts. Um, I mentioned the $260 billion global spend on PV and, and uh, wind. I think we should take a portion of that and spend it on, on, the, on the challenges we've discussed, more than is being done right now. I mentioned about $12 billion globally, maybe on all private and public R&D, and that's being generous. Um, so I think the first point is we just need to do more on the innovation side than, than we are. The second thing I would say is that um, with respect to the U.S., right now the production tax credit is, uh, in, is promiscuous. It will fund any wind plant. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a plain vanilla technology or an advanced technology. And, uh, you know, I think if we could think about how to target what dollars are available to, you know, high capacity factor, the kinds of things that, that um, Fort was mentioning, some of the advanced designs, you know, cup wind plants coupled with storage so you have dispatch, you know, dispatchability, 
all those kinds of things, we could get a lot smarter about the money that we, we do have as well. Um, and then finally, the way the Department of Defense does this, and we don't really do this so much in energy, is they say, you know, we want this thing. We want a plane that flies through radar and undetected. Here's a billion dollars. You know, we'll check in every three months. Um, you know, that's not what we have in the energy innovation system in this country. We have a bunch of bottoms up kind of lab stuff that, you know, and, and university stuff come, coming in as proposals to DOE. We've got to get more systematic about what exactly is we want. I think the Sunshot is a good example of a very targeted set of goals, what, vastly underfunded, but, you know, um, get more strategic and systematic about how we solve this problem. Well, I, I certainly agree that um, uh, more R&D uh, sh it should be done is needed. Uh, there was a little bit of a discussion this morning about, you know, the either or is it basic science or is it deployment related. I think a, a successful R&D program, and, and I think the Department of Defense has embraced this for many years as well. Uh, it's it's all of the above, right? You work across uh, basic science all the way to early stage uh, innovations, all the way through demonstration projects all the way through deployment. So I think that uh, uh, you, you really can't ignore any, any part of that difficult path that goes from the light bulb going on over your head into large scale commercial deployment. Do you want to add anything? Okay, so probably about half of the questions that I have here are saying, what about this other technology? What about this other technology? This is an interesting um, comment here. The opening statement by Michael Schellenberger said that, uh, uh, to the topic of energy innovation emphasized to the audience to not lock into favorite technologies, yet this program orphans technologies such as waste to renewable gasification because it does not fit into the established category solar, wind, nuclear, energy storage. Uh, how does the U.S. DOE incubate orphaned technologies? Um, and uh, so there's waste gasification, there's a question about tidal energy, there is a question about uh, geothermal um, and, and I know that Armand is interested in, in CCS. There's obviously a lot of things out there. Um, and we, we want to emphasize that, that you know, all technologies need to have some help. But, but how can we think about this in terms of where we put our resources? Um, what is the smart way to allocate things? Um, trying to get outside the boxes we've set up right here. Well, uh, let me add that. The Department of Energy actually funds a number of these, uh, those different technologies that you mentioned there, you know, including you know, uh, some early work on wave and, and tidal energy storage, uh, sorry, energy generation systems. And so, um, uh, you know, I think one of the, the great uh, resources that we have in this country is actually some of the mines that we have uh, at some of our nation's laboratories. And sometimes ideas take a decade or more to percolate and actually mature. Sometimes initial concepts, you know, that, that, that you know, are born out of someone's mind, uh, some scientist's mind, actually takes a long time. You look at the pathway towards uh, first commercial adoption of, of a lot of different technologies. You know, we, we had the, um, uh, the talk in the morning talking initially about hydraulic fracking. You know, that's decades and decades of hard work by our scientists and engineers to figure out some of the key challenges and overcome those in order to, to eventually make the technology palatable. And so, um, uh, so, so there are early stage investments in a lot of this, these different technologies and we need to continue at least at some level to make investments because, uh, but, but then again, some of these technologies like wind and solar are actually closer to full-blown maturity. And, uh, and those technologies are at different stages and, and, and have different needs. And so uh, I actually do believe in the all of the above strategy. There are challenges in all sorts of technologies. You know, some are closer than others. But, but that doesn't mean that the technology incumbent today or the, the technology that will mature tomorrow is the one that will last till the end of time. Yeah, all of the above makes sense. You know, we don't want all our eggs in one basket. You know, utilities will, will tell you that. They're not willing to, uh, you know, only build gas plants. They want to have a mix of supply. Uh, you know, betting on one technology, coal, uh, got us in the, in the hole we're in right now. So uh, we do need to uh, embrace a diverse set of technologies. And I, I agree with men and the example of fracking. It, it takes a long time, and so having uh, a sustained engagement, having stability, uh, having some certainty that you're uh, 
you're, as, a, as a scientist, that uh, there's going to be a long-term engagement on making your new idea a success. That's, that's so important. It's very difficult to achieve, actually, uh, within the context of an annual budget cycle where the baseline is, is, is zero <laughs> for every single budget cycle. So I think that kind of uh, stability of focus and that long-term perspective is, is absolutely required. Kevin, just a quick amendment. I agree with Ford. I think the real process challenge is um, if we're going to make DOE, for example, or some version of it into an innovation engine, we're going to have to have the stability and, most importantly, strategy. Um, it's just basically it's a constituency-driven um, uh, process right now. It's you know we've got the wind lobby, the solar lobby, the coal lobby, you know, and, and on and on and on, um, uh, pressing for their and then the labs, which have their own pet projects. It's just a mishmash, and you know what what really is, needs to be done. It's really hard with congressional oversight and the annual budget cycle, and everyone congressman wants to have something going on in his district or her district. Uh, you've got to establish some kind of strategy. And I would argue that uh, one of the criteria we should look at is what's scalable to terawatt scale. You know, I'll just beat a dead horse here. Carbon capture and storage and nuclear, I think those are the two big orphans right now. They're expensive to do in the demo demonstration scale, but boy, if you get it right, they do scale. Um, and they, they don't have at least these problems. They have a whole other set of problems you have to solve. So um, I would just argue that the, the key here is creating some process, if we are able to maintain any money for this, some kind of process where we, we prioritize or at least rebalance the portfolio in some proportion to what we think you know, might actually pay off. Just, okay. um, here's a question for Fort. Um, can you comment on the reliability of wind turbines over the 20-year life? I've heard anecdotal reports of sharply declining capacity factors as turbines age. Is this a ripe right area for innovation? So um, big issue with all of the cost estimates depend on the turbines actually lasting as long as you think. So I'd be interested to hear what you have to say, but also Armand, if you have any, any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, wind turbines have been uh, under development since the 70s, and uh, the earlier generations of the machines uh, were not as reliable. Uh, the suppliers of machines today will tell you they will last 20 years, but it's a fair question, you know, how do you know? Uh, you won't really know until those 20 years have passed. But there have been tremendous uh, advances been made in reliability. The Department of Energy has been investing in reliability, and we've made some progress. There have been some innovations that directly support uh, reliability. Uh, for example, one of the most complicated parts of a wind turbine is the gearbox that takes the low RPM, high torque power from the rotor and turns it into high RPM, low torque uh, power like a generator wants to see. Recently, a number of companies, and uh, DOE was, so had some pioneering work that led to this concept, have been developing what are called direct drive generators, uh, giant generators, maybe uh, 20, 30 feet in diameter, uh, that are directly attached to the rotor. And so the most reliable gearbox is the one that's not installed. So that's an example of the way innovations can support reliability. And uh, I think that reliability, in addition to being supported by innovation, you know, that's, that's, that's a detailed job. You look at the way aviation has achieved reliability, uh, you, you invest and test and test and test at the detailed subcomponent level. It, it, it's oftentimes a, a, a get the details right more than an innovation job. Okay. Um, one thing I want to make sure we get to, because this is a, a source of confusion a lot of times, we're talking about where do we want to scale. This, in fact, this uh, chart we have here shows you know, options of going up to what, it's hard to see from here, but maybe even 80% uh, in some cases of, of the total energy um, produced. Um, what, what, is your, what are your thoughts in terms of what does solar and wind, what do these have to do? What part do they have to play in order to get to that goal? Not just in the United States, but worldwide of, of getting off of fossil fuels generally. I mean, do we, do we need to get, get to 80% renewables? What, what, is the, what is the target here we're actually talking about? Well, there, there's, no, there's no a priori target. I mean, if we could, look, we could run the entire world on nuclear power right now, and if we built, uh, you know, 30,000 nuclear power plants at one megawatt, more or less, we can, we can do the zero carbon thing. Are we going to do that? No. Um, so the question is really cost and um, you know, uh, and how much of the, you know, how, what diversification you want. So these are all arbitrary numbers. The point of this chart was not to say we shouldn't move down a wind and solar path to some extent. It's just to say that the kinds of studies that you see out there that rather blithely assert that, 
you know, you can, you can do 100% or 80% of the world's grid on wind and solar, you know, just have that little problem to deal with. So, I, you know, I, I guess, Kevin, my, the, the, the question I would have at the end of the day is, um, as a, as a, just as a theoretical or mathematical matter, you can't run the grid 100% on wind and solar unless you really believe that there's going to be perfect offsets in all geographies and you've got a completely interconnected global grid where, you know, the wind is always bouncing off. I mean, it's just those are, those, that's science fiction. Um, but, so I think you're down to a practical question of at what point does the penetration um, exceed the ability of the grid to cost effectively handle it? And what technical solutions do you have to fill that gap? Um, I, I, I pose the question of whether storage, although it's something we work on and really want to see happen, is it ever going to be sort of in the range of being able to deal with that kind of problem at any kind of cost that's, that's affordable? And that, I think, is the real upper limit. We can get to zero on the cost of the, of the solar cells or whatever, but we're still going to have this, this issue. Okay, and we're going to hear from uh, Ambry, I believe, next to panel, so that hopefully we'll hear the answer to that. Armin mentioned earlier the renewable electricity futures study that was released by NREL last year. It's, it's really a very interesting study, and it considers a number of scenarios. The, uh, the, the flagship was 80% of the United States electricity from renewables, but it considered a, a wide range of scenarios from 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. And I think the, the important uh, answer regarding the grid integration challenges was it, it gets progressively harder as you try to uh, go past 20% uh, or so. Not, not too many challenges, 20% or so. So I think, I think it will get progressively harder. And it does require R&D to solve these problems. And, and storage is probably part of the answer. Uh, operating the grid more flexibly is part of the answer. Building more transmission is part of the answer. There's no, there's no magic bullet. We're going to have to do a lot of things to go to very high levels of penetration. But hey, we've got a long way to go. I mean, right now, wind is at like 4%. Uh, we've got a long way to go to get to the, uh, even the 20% where this starts uh, becoming more of an issue. We need to invest now. We need to have a, a sustained long-term investment. And I think the problems are solvable. I, I actually totally agree. There are um, innovations that are happening. I mean, if you look at just storage, for example, uh, storage itself, there's innovations and investments that are being made today, uh, and hopefully we'll continue to make those investments that will lower the cost of, of energy storage. So imagine if just a few years ago, the price of solar panels is about, was about uh, three to four times higher than it is today. Imagine what would happen if energy storage, you know, either electrochemical, chemical, thermal, whatever, uh, storage mechanisms, uh, could we come down that kind of a learning curve in that kind of a quick period of time? It would actually open up the door tremendously for all sorts of, of uh, energy generation sources if we had some moderate level of storage. Now, is it going to happen in two years, four years? Probably not, but it could happen. And if we continue to make those investments, then, uh, then that will be a more likely scenario. OK. Um, I have a question here about um, how do we expand the focus internationally? Um, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that, and then maybe since we just have a few minutes left, if this would be an appropriate time that you could make uh, any last comments that you want to make uh, in closing. So we'll just move from Fort over the, this direction. Well, there's a number of active collaborations uh, operated by the International Energy Agency that um, bring nations together to share R&D results for a variety of technologies, um, uh, including solar and wind and other renewable sources. I think that's really an important uh, collaborative uh, effort in the in the research space. I think that in terms of you know operating the grid and issues with a large scale deployment of renewables, there's probably uh, room for more collaboration than we're seeing now. You know, there, uh, Ireland is an example. Very very weak ties to the rest of the planet. Uh, you know they're operating something like 20 percent wind. Uh, a lot of um, you know if we can do that, then uh, a lot of our other challenges uh, you know can be solved. Kevin, I think the central fact is that the U.S. and Europe are essentially irrelevant to future demand growth in the world. Um, most of the energy growth in the world is Asia um, projected, or certainly the developing world more broadly. Europe might even shrink over 20 years, and the U.S. is you know, going to be much more modern growth. That has real implications for innovation. When you're growing, you innovate. Um, you know, when you, you can afford to rip out stuff and replace it when you've got the, the basic you know, revenue base growing. We're not growing our energy system substantially in the U.S. That's a big challenge. One reason we're working right now with China, I'm trying to facilitate a lot of work between U.S. and Chinese companies, is China has the demand, it has the liquidity, 
One company in China, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation, has a $15 billion alternative energy budget business unit. That's the entire, that's four or five years worth of the DOE uh, innovation budget, essentially. So, you know, we got to look in places of the world where there's real demand, real opportunity to experiment, and I'd say China is, is certainly one of those places. Um, final comment. I'm the baseload guy on this panel. We really have to remember that when we're talking about innovation. So often the discussion and the zero carbon discussion goes to intermittency and variability, uh, uh, variable generation. You know, important stuff to be working on, but again, you need the grid. You need the backbone of the grid. And in a world where 70 percent uh, of the population is going to be living in dense urban areas uh, uh, pretty soon, um, uh, I'm going to submit that. Uh, we're going to need a lot of base load, and fossil is going to be part of that. And if nuclear isn't part of it, I don't think we're going to get anywhere near our zero carbon targets. Great. Well, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.